Okay, well, um, uh, two minutes ago, we had three pages. Now we've got six. I'm sure we'll finish up with probably around eight or something. So uh, we'll go ahead and, and jump in here. Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? Everyone wave at everyone. Say hello to your brothers and sisters. And uh, look around. We do probably have some folks that are out on uh, spring break. And some of them will probably jump in um, because kids here. Um, if it were just me doing it, they would just stay on vacation. But some of them will probably jump in, and that's exciting. And uh, uh, some of them may not have signal, so they won't be able to jump in. But yeah, super uh, encouraged that all you guys are here. Um, really, really appreciate all the um, uh, love and great feedback from last week. I tried to send as much of that along to Kid as, as, as possible, wanting him to be encouraged that the Lord is using him here in H-Town. I pray that uh, you've all been praying more and been praying with more fervor, with more zeal, and with more faith, especially. And uh, the quiet times this week have been great. Uh, today was day 17, right? And um, um, so uh, prayerfully, everyone's, you know, looking through eyes of faith and realizing, you know, uh, uh, I think it was yesterday where God gave Hezekiah extra time, you know, and a couple of days before that, he showed all the people the chariots of fire. And uh, I'm sure uh, some of you uh, zealots out there have been praying to see those chariots ever since. And uh, just keep the faith. You Once you see them, please let us know. And I hope you guys are all, you know, continuing to have your, your impossible prayers in front of you every day so that you, you see them, not only see them, but you pray them every day. Uh, the point was never to write them down and, and say, amen, I prayed about those. What's next? No, it's pray every day. And, and um, <clears throat> if you miss a day, you know, okay, well, then pray even harder the next day. But let's don't miss two days of prayer. Let's certainly don't miss three days of prayer. And uh, uh, God forbid if you've been struggling and man you haven't prayed hardly at all during this time it's not too late we still over ha have over half our time together uh over half the book is still left so i want to encourage you to really uh go for it guys and and move god's heart and uh, all those things that you're trying to get god to do whether it's for your your family and your friends and all those kind of things uh uh, finances, uh, your faith, uh, your spiritual health, um, whatever the case may be, just praying, of course, that it's all done through the Holy Spirit. Uh, I ask you all to be praying every day that the church will end the year at over 700 in number, and I hope you're doing that. Um, um, I, I won't take it personally that you don't love me if you're not. I'll just assume you forgot, but, um, um, uh, but please, uh, I will feel loved if you tell me, hey, we're praying, so let me know. Uh, uh, let me know. Hey, I prayed today, 700, baby, or over, over 700. And so I hope the more things I believe that we do together, the more things we do collectively, the more things we're committed to as one body, uh, I believe the more God will move. And so, uh, yeah, I just want people to be excited about their faith. I want people to be excited about Christianity. And you know what? If you're not, then make sure you talk to somebody. Uh, uh, many of you have probably taken up Kip, Kip's challenge to get a prayer partner. Um, even if that prayer partner is, hey, you pray over the phone for 10 minutes together and then you have your own longer prayer later. Just do that. Even if it's only a couple of minutes, you know, do that. It'll inspire you and people will be asking you about your prayers and how you're doing and, and make sure you're writing down your God sightings. You know, as you see God move in little things and as you see God move in big things, then make sure you're writing that down and uh, just all these kinds of things, guys, will add to your faith. All these kinds of things will, will give you zeal that's, that's real, right? And uh, that's what we want. That's what we need. Uh, things are starting to open up little by little again. And, and so, man, we just need to be on our mission and uh, re really, really going after it. And, and uh, I, I think first and foremost, our purpose is to have that relationship with God. And that's why, you know, the first January, February, March, and soon to be April, we will still be focusing on prayer. Because, man, our relationship with God can mean everything. I also want to remind you that uh, or let you know that our special missions will be the first Sunday in June. Uh, and um, um, and so please be praying about that. Put that on your impossible. You know, last year, that was an impossible prayer, even though we didn't know it, right, that we would actually give the most we've ever given for special missions as a church was last year. And you, you guys wouldn't be surprised that Doug's probably thinking, let's give even more this year. Loan that guy. Well, you're right. You do know that guy. And that is my goal uh, for us to give even more. So we got to be praying. Um, I think a lot of you have, have received stimulus checks, and, and uh, uh, I know many need it just to keep things going, amen, but others, you're getting your tax returns back, your stimulus checks, you know, please give to the Lord first, please go, you can start giving missions and just uh, state it on there as missions, and, uh, you know, we'll have another phenomenal year with that this year, so, um, and um, yeah, just reminding everyone, the marriage retreat is um, um, the first uh, Saturday in May. 
And so uh, that's going to be great. Steve and Charlie Stevenson, who uh, led the Gulf Coast region several years back for um, uh, a year or two, they're going to be coming into town because the uh, uh, Hoopers weren't able to do it after all. And so they're going to be coming into town. We're going to be in person. It's going to be awesome. And I hope you're excited about that. I hope you're more excited than you are afraid of being in person. You know, God's going to God's going to make that great, you know, and uh, we're going to definitely continue being wise. But uh, yeah, I just I just want people to. Uh, to enjoy their life and enjoy the freedom we have in Christ and, and uh, uh, still with great wisdom and care. And, you know, pretty much every one of you already is very careful and, and, and very wise. So I don't need to preach to the choir, but, but yeah, just, let's, let's just love people. Amen. And uh, so we'll have a word of prayer here and then I'll turn it over to Kit. And uh, uh, if we have some time at the end, if we don't, we'll just break up into our small groups. But if you have some time at the end, uh, we'll be able to, uh, uh, Kit will be able to take some questions and comments, okay? And so um, uh, last week, our elder, uh, Ronnie uh, Rich prayed for us. And so, Rhett, would you mind uh, opening us up with a uh, prayer this evening? And then once he says amen, Kit, bam, hit the ground. Gotcha. Thank you. God, we are so excited tonight to be together as a family and to be able to hear uh, your message from your Holy Spirit. God, we pray that our eyes would be open, our hearts would be softened, and God, our will would be steadfast as we think about how we can better uh, grow in our relationship with you. We do pray for, for, for your will to be done here in this world, uh, just like it is in heaven. And that you will use us to uh, just encourage and build each other up as the body of Christ. But that, Father, we will Amen. also be able to uh, reach out to those who are hurting in this world. Yes. And in any way we can, Father. And that right now, you put on the hearts of men, uh, men and women on this, this meeting time. Something that you want them to accomplish. Something great that you want them to accomplish for you and for your honor and glory. Be with Kit. May he have the Holy Spirit running through his mind and his heart as he shares with us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm, I've missed you ever since last week. I've been looking forward to this because we had a great time and, and you guys were so, you know, hospitable and, and kind and, uh, and I felt like it was a moving time. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you with something. I dare you to get more out of this than I get out of it. Meaning, I promise you, you're going to give me more than I give you. And that, that's always how this thing works, is the more that you give, the more that you receive. And so I don't want you to think that I'm, this isn't a sacrifice. This is like, you know, this is a win-win because you guys are, are charging me up. And so I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Doug, thank you, bro. Um, every single week, man, I, I want to say thanks and uh, for allowing us to have this kind of time. So uh, anyway, for the sake of time, let's just jump right in. And I'm going to need your help, okay? So I'm going to give everybody an assignment tonight. You ready? All right, when we get to the 745 mark, y'all start losing your minds, okay? That's my alarm clock because... <laughs> Because we got to have some time to talk, you know, and a brother can get kind of stirred up. And but if we're already there, should we just maintain until then? Because, okay, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, I, I, I get fired up and I'll, I'll go on. Paul, you know, preaching all night. You know, he did it. Somebody fell out of the top story window. So anyway, last week um, I told you that, that I was going to introduce you to my partner, right? Like we didn't get around to roots last week, right? And, and Doug, throughout this process, <laughs> if ever I've gone down a rabbit tail and told a story and I'm like, you know, one of, one of your uh, older crazy uncles is getting ready to tell the same story again at the same party, just go, hey, bro, we already got that one, man. Uh, I see you, bro. All right. So Roots, if, uh, if you see me, <laughs> I was about to say, if you see me in a prison, you're not going to see me in a prison because you're not going to be in there. But if you see me at a school, Roots would be with me. If you see me, if I ever get to preach down there with y'all, I'll bring Roots, he'll be on stage. If I'm with a, you know, an athletic program, boom, Roots is there. Prisons, absolutely on the streets. At a corporate event, <laughs> it's so much fun. I get, he's become like a rock star. Like, you know, I showed you those two state, state championship rings in there. He got them, man. I mean, the players come out of the tunnel, they wanna to touch Roots. 
Kennesaw State University, our local college here, the biggest university in the state of Georgia. I work with their basketball program. Man, I got a text and it said, is Roots available on March the 7th? No lie. Division one basketball, the, you know, the, the attorney's about to start. And this was last year, not, not this year. And they wanted him on the bench, man. <laughs> it's like he's got this magic. And, and so it's getting ridiculous. People want their picture with Roots. And I'm like, can I hold him? You know, I mean, I, I can be in the picture. But anyway, the reason why he captures people's imagination is not because he's so cool looking, and he is. But if I said, you know, what is he? If we were in a live event, we're in a live event, but you know what I'm saying? I'd say, uh, tell me what it is. And people yell, um, a walking stick, you know, a cane, a staff, you know, Moses had a staff, Gandhi had that cool stick, you know, and it was symbolic. It was always meaning, right? And so you might be like, oh, cool. You went and bought it and painted it. I didn't. Nobody's ever said it's a branch. Nobody's ever called it a branch because you don't see the branch anymore. You see this piece of art. And so I started thinking about the journey of this branch. And down, I know exactly where he was born. Downtown Atlanta, imagine him, 100-year-old oak tree and roots is, man, he's got the life. I mean, shoot, he's connected to the source and dew and nice rain, sunshine, birds, you know, kind of perched out on roots. And it's just a beautiful life. And then in one moment, he was disconnected from his life and his purpose. And he was flat on the ground, flat on his back. And he became trash. Yeah, this is right on the square in Marietta, which is the county seat in the second most important county in Georgia. I mean, this is like the power center right here. And God gave me this, this office right here on the square, the studio. And it's, it's kind of like this favor. And I told you last time, last time it was the story of the knucklehead. And this time you're gonna meet, you know, the band of brothers that I told you about. I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce you. And Roots is their champion. And the reason I call him Roots, and again, he was knocked to his back. It might have been a, a big storm, or it could have been a lightning strike, or it might have been an axe or a saw at the root. And he was knocked out. And the reason I call him Roots is because of the brother that found him and made him. So we were working downtown Atlanta, and we're, we're just trying to help some kids. And so we got this church down there, and, and uh, we... <laughs> We bought a broken down church building with nothing but a couple of bank statements that had nothing in it and a credit report that wasn't very impressive and no business history whatsoever. And they sold us this church. <laughs> and so we took it and it was our little, little central point. And me and a great brother named Gary Burke that helped me build this thing. He's a, a beautiful ex-con and he's, you know, he's part of our thing. And he got out and he did it right. And he went, and he already had a degree, but he went and got a master's in divinity from a tough school. I got a master's in theology, but it wasn't, it was kind of like, yeah, I did it. But this is like a real, real place. And he got a master's in divinity, no longer ex-con. Now it's Pastor Burke. And now he's about that close. May, he'll have his PhD in McAfee School the Theological Seminary is no joke. And, and so Gary is a, he's a beast in my book. And, and we rode the streets together and across America. And we went in prison after prison after prison. And we rode and we created this thing. And, uh, and it, was, it was very powerful. The story of Roots, it comes out of that neighborhood, right by that church. Gary's the pastor of that church. And I was able to sell it to him for a dollar. <laughs> And you're like, oh, that's so gracious. No, I unloaded the debt and the liability. <laughs> I said, take it for a dollar. And, uh, but it's a cool little part of the pop story. Um, but anyway, he's doing heroic work down there. And there's nasty branch laying on the street. Nobody saw it. You know, when, I, when a branch falls into my yard, um, I, I, I say, clean up the trash and put it in a pile, burn it, or get it hauled away. Because we, I mean, nasty. But see, somebody saw him different. And it's this brother named Roots. And he would always come and serve with us and help us. And he'd be like, uh, brother Kit, he cool little guy, dark skin, Jamaican descent. He had these cool long dreads and a little beard, these rock star glasses missing the stem. 
because he lived on the streets. And so Roots, my homeless brother, and he'd come and he'd, he'd hustle, man, and he would help us. Very bright brother. I mean, this, this isn't, you might have seen him at his low point, but he's no way low. He's a strong man. He's a young man. He's a brilliant man and better man than me. And so he would say, you need a stick. <laughs> and I'd be like, why do I got to have a stick, Roots? He always had them. He said, you need protection. You know, if you're going to work these streets, you got to have protection. That's why I have them. And so I'm like, well, how do I get one? And he said, that's what I do. You know, it's my thing. It's my hustle. And I said, hook me up. And so the next week, you know, it comes with this. Now, it was 2013. So it wasn't really painted as much, but it was he he went out in that tough little neighborhood and he searched for just the right instrument. And nobody saw it but him because we find what we look for. And he was looking for an instrument and he had a noble purpose, which was to protect me, a friend, protecting a friend and looking for an instrument of noble purpose that he can give as a gift, as a symbol of peace. I mean, good Lord, that's a movie. And so when he gave it to me, it was so special. <laughs> and, and then I moved on because it was time, it was time for Gary to lead that church. And so I moved on and started doing my work. And that's when I went up to the Midwest and then out West. And Roots is the symbol that I took and he's with me all the time. And I, I hold him up in, in, you know, gymnasiums and I say, what's his name? And they yell Roots and I, at corporate events. I mean, they gotta do it too. I don't care, Wells Fargo what's his name? And they yell, Roots, people do what you ask them to do. <laughs> Just ask them nice. And so, I mean, it's crazy. We get these pictures with Roots. Everybody wants him. And he becomes this little rock star. And I lost Roots. You know, he, I, I moved on and I couldn't find him. And um, a beautiful um, partner who became his wife. She's disabled. And so beautiful sister in a wheelchair and beautiful Roots ready to work. And he changed my life. And so the least of these, <laughs> he might have been an angel. I don't know. And I'm not going to try to cry all the way through this one. You know how I like to do that. But, you know, he, he passed. And on December 27th, this past year, I celebrated 15 years sober. You know, last drink, December 27th, four days before the biggest drinking year, <laughs> the night of the year. And I said, it's a wrap. I can't do this anymore. I, don't, I might not have four days left. That I might die on that night. And so I turned myself in and that was a decision. There's a difference when I decide things. How many times have you decided something over and over and over? But then there comes a moment in time where you make a decision and say, no more. I'll do whatever it takes, man. I used to do whatever it took to get what I wanted. Well, now why don't I do whatever it takes to get what I want? But it's the right kind of want. And so that was what did it for me. So on December 27, 2005, now 15 years go by the same night, I get a text from Brother Burke, you know, the pastor down there. And he said, Roots died. And I was like, what happened? And a drunk driver hit him on his scooter. He's coming back from his job. Brother got him a job, got him a, a little spot for him and his lady. And he's coming home at night on his little scooter and a drunk driver takes him out on my sobriety day. My, my. So now when I hold him up, you better, ah, crap, I'm crying again. So when I come down and see y'all, unless I do real bad and I don't get him lined to death, I'm gonna, you're gonna meet him. And this is roots, I carry him proudly. And, and this homeless brother that did an act of kindness for a stranger is having his name shouted all over the world. Tell me that's not God. The last shall be first, the last. He said, I'll use the lowly and despised things of this world to shame the wise. Man, you think you're smart? Let me show you something. Homeless brother gonna have a bigger impact than your whole movement. How about that? Tens of thousands of people have, have shouted his name. And I'm not, that wasn't about your whole thing. I'm talking about God saying the least of these, it's, it's their time. They've been at the end of the line long enough. It's time for an army of least of these to raise up 
And that's what I've gotten to see. And so for the last 10 years, I've been preaching that God was going to raise an army of brothers behind the wire that were going to shock the world. And they were going to be the heroes we've been waiting for. Isn't that just how God would do it? We got all these nice, religious, beautiful churches on every corner, every all the saved people judging those brothers under the bridge, the brothers behind the wire, the, the, the young lady on the corner, judging them all. None of us, I'm saying sometimes it happens. And, and yet God said, you don't even know. Some of them are angels that you're judging. You don't judge the angels? <laughs> and so this whole process is about removing the scales from our eyes so that we can see things the way they really are. That was Gehazi when he said, when Elijah said, open his eyes. And he said, whoa, where's those chariots of fire have been the whole time? And they've been around us ever since. And you hadn't seen them. And so he gave him the gift because God said he was going to hide the kingdom from the wise and learned. What if we get so wise and learned that we can't see it anymore? And it becomes a term, the kingdom. And we might miss it. Maybe nobody on this call, maybe it was just me, but I was missing it. And I was like, whoa, it's so much bigger than I could ever imagine. <laughs> and so his promises are the same. And here's what he says. Now to him who is able, he's able to do immeasurably more. You can't even measure how much more he can do than all we can ask or imagine Activate your imagination and try to imagine your wildest thing coming true, that you fall madly in love with your wife again. That happened for me more than when I met her. 15 years later, 12 years later, that's a miracle. Don't tell me miracles don't happen. Win the respect back of a son, <laughs> that's a miracle. Tell me miracles don't happen. Red Sea Parton, miracle. Shoot, me being able to have that kind of closeness with brothers that I've craved for so long, that's a miracle. And so we open our eyes and we start seeing God everywhere. And he said, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask, <laughs> all we ask, present your request. How many times does he beg us in the gospels? <sighs> Wear the judge out, he'll hook you up. The, the persistent widow, come on, even the friend that gets to get up in the middle of the night, he'll, he'll give him the bread. Why? Because he wouldn't stop. It's like, but we're afraid to add, might not be God's will. <laughs> shut up and just, just quit overthinking it. Ask your daddy. Sorry, I said shut up, Doug. I just told your church to shut up. <laughs> oh, Michael, no, the, God says, get back to the Bible. <laughs> then all we can ask or imagine according to his power, not our power, his power that is at work, not could be, used to be, might be, his power that is at work within us. To God be the glory. Okay, so there's so much packed in that one little passage. I missed it. You know how easy it is to preach that passage right there? Shoot. You don't got to go to seminary, be trained up in the ICOC to preach that. That, that thing preaches itself. Brother's been preaching that forever, and I preached it hard, and I missed it. It was like I didn't even see it, it was sitting right in front of me. And I was thinking that, anyway, that's the spirit of this project is Abba, Daddy. He got it all. He give it to anybody he wants, and I'm his son. Man. There's no, I couldn't be in a safer place. So when life squeezes me, maybe that's him hugging me. <laughs> and I've been blaming Jesus, my big brother, not my Lord. He is my Lord. He'll never stop being that. He is my savior. Of course he is. He does sit on the throne. He's the judge. All of that is good. But he also says he's not ashamed to call me his brother. And so, and sister too. And so why can't he be my big brother? 
man, he's mad at me for a long time as far as I knew. Now he's my big brother. And you know what? Big brothers never let anybody pick on their little brothers. I don't care if they're beefing all the time. Anybody's got to, you know, do your head like that. If you had an older brother, younger brother, and you beef all the time, Paulina, I see you. Yeah, you're like, we whoop on each other, but somebody messed with that. Okay, now let's go to war. I don't care how bad we got it going on right now. Now it's two. Two are better than one. We will we'll beat the brakes off of you. And then you beat the brakes off of them and then go back and you start squabbling again. <laughs> you, start, you pick it up. Okay, so I got big brother that is just like fiercely protective of me. Don't mess with me. Even if I'm being a knucklehead, especially when I'm being a knucklehead. We even do that with our siblings, right? And then the Holy Spirit, the best friend I always wanted. So when I was out there on my own, I realized that he was riding with me the whole time and I just had missed him. And all those scriptures about the counselor and the advocate and the spirit and the comforter and good Lord, the comforter is supposed to comfort. So when we're hurting, why, do, why would we ignore him? The counselor is supposed to teach us. So why don't we get in a position to learn? You know, the, the advocate is going to defend us. So when we're being attacked, why don't we let him do the work instead of lashing back on Facebook? How dare you offend me? Let the Holy Spirit do that. See, we got the Abba, my daddy, my big brother fighting my battles for me and my best friend, shoot, best friends, that's ride or die. And so, you know, somebody stand up against me and I got my brother with me. I'm going to introduce you to the brothers behind the wire. This is the army of the least of these. And I'm so proud to be able to introduce you to them. Somebody nod if we're, if I'm tracking, does it, everybody see it? Okay. The power of peace project is what they gave birth to. Oh, that's the latest book. If you, if you want to hear this story and these are all my ideas on how to reform a broken system that's built to fail, repeat customer model that is evil by design, and it's the new Jim Crow. And this book is about the, all the brothers I'm about to introduce you to and more and how we're going to flip the script. This is what we're doing. We're, we're coming up with a whole new convict code. Convict code is how you got to live inside a prison. And I've done so many hours and days and months and years with these beautiful brothers behind the wire they taught me that convict code. You can't learn the code without being inside or at least being very knowledgeable with the streets because they're very similar codes, but not all the way. And so we flipped the script and we came up with a new code. And so we tried it. That's the brother that God put next to me. And the first guy that I met in the most dangerous prison in the state of Georgia, they call him Sir Brown. And I did not know when I sat down on that first bleacher, the brother sitting to my left would become the strongest, most valuable brother to me. I mean, you talk about ride or die, that brother has saved my life. And I, I'm connected to him to this day, not just kind of, we communicate all the time. And, you know, you don't even know how. He's my brother, I owe him. He's done everything for me. And, you know, if I have to communicate with him through his family, then that's so be it. He writes me letters. That's how, that's how we do. If I got to get him a message, his father is a friend. I've preached in his little holiness church up in Jersey City three times. It's a little storefront holiness preacher. Be careful how you judge. He pulled Brown out of the, the Brown who hit the streets. He, would, he robbed drug dealers. He, he collected for the mafia because he's a boxer, strong man. And he knew those streets. And that one preacher was the one that wouldn't stop loving him. And he'd go get Brown when he was a young man. He'd bring him in, let him get a shower and get a couple nights sleep, feed him real well. And Brown hit the streets. He's running things. And then he comes down to Georgia and, you know, had a bad day. And he's sitting right next to me. He believed in this before it even began. He said, bro, you're going to take this thing all over the world. And I was like, who, who you kid? I'm, I'm just trying to deal with my shame. And you know, you know what I just did? <laughs> I'm, I'm still living in shame. He believed in me. And see these prisons, they became my safe place because it was a place free from judgment and gossip and slander. 
And so I was running from church, but Brown, he's my, my one guy in all these 10,000 inmates, over 100 prisons. He's my guy. And we're going to get him out. The state says he'll never go home. Life sentence, no possibility of parole. Either I believe in miracles or I don't. And so he's coming home somehow, some way. I'm having a hard time advancing my slide, brother man. I wonder why that is. Oh man. Hold on, I'm gonna try this again. I apologize. Let me try this again, see what happens. Oh, this is really bothering me. Try it one more time. Somebody say a prayer. This is very important. You need to reboot it or? Not sure. I'm not going to keep going for forever, but there we go. <laughs> Somebody said a prayer and this, I'm the prayer guru and I'm like, oh, maybe we should pray. So this is the first guy we baptized. His name's Dre. And he was a gangster disciple. Very screen, share, share, share screen. Share yeah. screen again, you are killing me, kid. I got to get you guys back. And this is being recorded. This is going to be fun. You can do it. <laughs> there yeah. you go. Hey, go everybody. Go <laughs> this is this. Hey, man. There you go. All right. So this is uh, Andre. And he's, like I just said, a heavy GD. And he steps forward. And he becomes the leader of this young thing. And we tried a peace movement in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and peace began to spread through this prison. All those brothers were baptized on that day. We used a baptistry that they had never used at this prison. Had to get permission from the state. Okay, so you're the one that maybe is like, yeah, somebody's doing some crazy stuff. These are my band of brothers. I didn't have a church back then. Something's happening. Like, y'all see that? Yeah. 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 Man, I'm so sorry. We're having so serious happy. technical difficulties. And yeah, I'm gonna try one more time and we'll see what we can do. Do you need to hit that arrow at the bottom? That's where I'm going every time. Like I'm hitting it and it's not going anywhere. There we go. There Took you go. There you okay, go. There you there go. go. Took it to Michigan. Thanks, Steve. And this was significant because the Muslim brothers joined us. It was very hard to get the Muslim brothers because they are, you know, hated and they, they're tough. It's a gang. And so won the respect of the Muslims when they joined us in this Michigan prison, violence plummeted and it got 50% reduction in violence in two years and set state records because of those brothers. Went next door to Ohio. This is where it became a movement. And those brothers right there, rivals, and we've only been together two days. And then it's like, this is when they make their, their pledge and they're like 40 days of peace, no more violence for 40 days. And that, that group right there did 99% no violence. And the one brother that, you know, he was protecting himself, but we don't use asterisks. <laughs> the warden, this is like Pharaoh that kept just going, go ahead and go. And then he'd come to his senses. God would just open his wardens were letting us do crazy things like put black t-shirts on inmates and you know hope is a new dope <laughs> it's like they were just doing whatever we wanted but look at all the rivals in there oh these guys are, are there's gary right there he's the one he's the pastor you know that i was telling you about took it out west because they invited us see when they're having gang violence they were hearing about this new peace movement and so we'd get invited like the bloods were doing well, it was getting real violent. And so they invite us in because there's no, there's no programs out there in the whole U.S. prison system, you know, for rival gangs. What about women? <laughs> so we took it next door to Nebraska and they're doing 40 days of prayer. So they're doing the same thing y'all did. Look at that joy. Now you think, maybe you don't, but some people might think that the least of these would have a harder time with this. They eat it up because they don't have anything else. We got so many quiet times. You order whatever books you want. You got like, you know, YouTubes and podcasts and good Lord, if you can't get stuff, you don't want stuff. They're hungry and they completed something and they got their certificates, man. 
What about youth? It took it to three juvenile prisons in Ohio. Now these are real prisons. The, the gang on the right is called the HBs. Their enemies are the heartless felons. Heartless felons been featured on gangland, most dangerous youth gang. And now they're taking over adult facilities. And so, you know, they were sending too many kids to the hole. And so they brought us there and, and we just got the two gang leaders to become friends. That's the Don on the right, Mr. White, and Mr. Evans on the left. They hated one another. They were enemies, so they fought all the time because they told their soldiers to. They became friends. That's the warden in the middle. He cried that day. They got our awards. Took it to more juvenile prisons. Then we just took it, <laughs> got invited. I went on a tour and, uh, in Ukraine, and that's prison number 40. God even gave me number 40. Our, my number's 40. And yeah, that daggum colonel back there in the back, he kept trying to get me to drink vodka. He'd go, vodka. And I'd be like, nah, I can't. <laughs> no, really, vodka. No, it's disrespectful. Vodka. I'm like, bro, if I drink that, I might stay. <laughs> I don't want to do that. And so we set it on chocolate and coffee. South Africa changed my life. We danced and we sang. Oh, man, it was a beautiful thing. They changed me forever, South Africa. And now we've got what, a half a dozen churches down there doing this 40 days of prayer. It's amazing. Deep into Honduras, seven prisons in Honduras. You've heard of MS-13, that is them. And that is their prison. There's no guards. <laughs> you don't, they don't have guards on the inside. They don't get clothes. They don't get food. It's like hustle. I mean, it's every man for himself. And they treated me with such respect. Amazing. Well, that's a prison in Tijuana. <laughs> that was in 2008. And 5,000 men took the prison over and held it for 30 days. And they brought tanks in and to, to take it back. And they set it on fire. And I know the guy that's, uh, that set the fire. And he's actually a pretty good guy. He's out now. Look at that. Those are our brothers, our graduates. Man, 40 days earlier, 50 men walked in looking at me like just mean mug. Who are you? I don't speak Spanish, but I had an interpreter named Jesus. <laughs> so I had Jesus with me. And 40 days later, look at the joy. There's cartel guys in that thing. They're just people, people that want to be loved. Look at that. Very, very, I could show you somebody in that picture that's a somebody. Took it to the kids. That's why I went down there. That's a prison. We're getting ready to take those kids in and play an exhibition game because <laughs> a bunch of beautiful convicts. That's, they're doing amazing things. One of the players, he he uh, gave his life to save a baby that was about to be kidnapped. Cartels executed him on the spot. He was one of the, our players down there. And so we, we have a, our highest award is the Billy Ponquito Courage Award. <laughs> That's a rehab facility. We helped a a cartel guy named, uh, they called him Mr. Clean. <laughs> we helped him get off of meth. And he's, he's, he's a beautiful guy. He just grew up in a place where they don't ask. That's him right there. <laughs> Maestro Olimpio. That's a cartel soldier. And that he's walking away from our meeting because uh, we had to see if he would let us use his field. Because <laughs> you can't just take over a field. And we wanted to do that. And so we fed tacos to the kids and we gave Chava all the credit. And he felt noble for one day, man, because he fed his little village just because he protected us and let us do our thing. That's on the streets. You can't probably see all the way over to the right. Um, you know, the guy that kind of, I don't know how, what you can and can't see. But that's five rival gangs on the streets. <clears throat> Remember Andre, first guy we baptized? He set this thing up. It's Crips, Bloods, GDs, Moors, and Nation of Islam down in West Atlanta. And uh, they, they're, it's a, a solidarity march against pl uh, police brutality. And I got invited to go, man. And they embraced me and I got to march with them. There's an army of the least of these. Y'all trust me until you believe me. We took cops through the same program the convicts did. <laughs> Whenever I say convict, it's respectful. I mean, I'm not it really, it's a, it means he's a man, learn how to do time. And so I couldn't get these dudes to do the homework. And so I'd say, man, the brothers behind the wire are kicking y'all's butts. And they wouldn't do the homework because we are just overfed in the free world, brother behind the wire. But I love them, man. I get to work with a lot of law enforcement, man. I got six police chiefs that I'm really close to. One of them's on my board. Love them. Then we took it to the toughest schools. 
That's up in Benton Harbor, Michigan. I've never been to a tougher school. There's guards on every hallway, 30% graduation rate. And the kids come, go through a metal detector, all the doors are locked, and they go and they report in, say here, and then they go wherever they want and do whatever they want. And they, the teachers can't tell them anything. I mean, the teachers just kind of just stay in a, a little room and nobody's learning anything. And maybe the only ones that, that they're ever going to listen to are these beautiful brothers behind the wire. You know, I mean, they speak their language. They've been there. They're the antivirus, man. They carry a viral load of the streets and crime. And the answer to, to crime in America and violence and racism in America is, in my opinion, transform criminals that have a new message. That's what God's doing. It's, it's a new thing. What about the little ones? That's Selma, Alabama. And I have a special relationship with Selma. They invited me because a kid got gunned down in the streets two o'clock in the afternoon, right in the sleepy little town in Selma that everybody thinks is like Kumbaya because Dr. King and John Lewis. It's stuck in 1965. Nobody cares about them. It's poor, it's dangerous, it's violent. And everybody shows up and gets their picture on the bridge. And they say, remember Selma. And it's like, then they forget again. And these little kids, they can't get out. And so what are we doing? Building more prisons, why? If kids can't read good by third or fourth grade, we got a bed for them. That's how we do, building more prisons than schools. That's where I could have been. <laughs> and that's at Angola State Prison. And I'd have gotten there by hurting somebody with my automobile until God, yeah, I might have taken out a guy like Roots. Shame. <laughs> this is the latest development. That's the prison czar of uh, the last administration, Pastor Tony Loudon, who is the pastor to President Jimmy Carter here in the state of Georgia, he was tapped um, by the president to be the prison reform czar. But then when the administration changed, Pastor Loudon was uh, a free agent. He's building a national board um, of influencers in prison reform, people that are out there doing. And he has invited me to be on his board. And so this is like, <sighs> I mean, I can't tell you how big this, this man is becoming a fast friend and doggone it on my pat on my, <laughs> on my impossible prayer list. All right, on the first one right there. Oh, you that's right. You guys can't see that right now. I'll show you in a minute. That's how I feel today. Bad days, tough days. Yeah. But look at those kids. Those kids are in Tijuana. Now here's the question. Do you believe that, that God is a God of plenty? Now, don't lose your mind. We got 30 seconds. I'm very close. So I kind of taking it back when I said lose your mind at 45. So God will do immeasurably more. So we have this little place down there, and, and we're, we're selling it because the, the family needs to take care of my wife's mom. And so this is a precious place. We spent a whole lot of time down there during the pandemic and these walks on the beach have saved my life. And it's not a, a beach that's known for shells. And so, you know, to get a, a shell like one of those on that beach is like it became a thing that I would ask for signs. And I'd be like, God, because I'm wrestling in prayer for, for some things that are going on that are really hard. I'm talking about right now in life, very hard things, family things, like rip your heart out, cry, snot, bubble kind of things. Like I'm talking about weeping on the beach, kind of sacred moments. And I'd be like, God, just give me a sign. Show me, give me a shell, just a beautiful shell. Just show me. And I'd find something and it was cool. And so one day I'm crying hard and I don't know, this is a few months ago. And I said, you got to show me something today, you know? And so I walked. And there's this place on down the beach where there's this big orange uh, fence kind of net because they're doing a lot of stuff, restoration and stuff with big, you know, bulldozers and stuff way up on the, that part of the, the beach. Nobody ever walks all the way up there. But the day, this day, the thing had fallen down. And so I'm like, hmm, I guess it doesn't apply to me. And so I kept on walking and I walked further than I ever had. And all of a sudden I looked up and there were shells everywhere. And I'm like, whoa. And so I start filling up my pockets with shells. I walk back, it's a mile. And so I go all the way back and I run in. I'm like, baby, give me a bag. 
And so I get a big old uh, shopping bag and I go another mile all the way down and I start putting them in there and I'm carrying them back and nobody knows. And I do this for three days. And finally on the last day, I'm coming back and this, this, poor, this older couple is coming down and they're just looking for shells. And I went, hey, keep walking that way, trust me. And I let them peek into my bag and they were like, oh. next day I, I come out and there's all kinds of people up there. And, but the shells were gone. They were all but gone. It was a three day miracle of shells. Those, that is what God gave me. I asked for a shell and he gave me that. And so we put them in that. And those are, that's three feet tall thing. That, there's a whole lot of shells. And those are like the kind you would buy in stores. And he's always, I think he wants to show us that he's got so much more than we think. And what if we keep him in this little box with these, you know, anemic, impotent prayers just hanging on by a thread? And we don't realize that he's Abba, he's daddy, and he owns it all. And big brother, man, he, he ain't mad at you. He's just a big brother, man. He, he, you know, big brothers, they, they beat on their knucklehead kids. Come on, man. So, you know, why we got to be so afraid? And the Holy Spirit, man, what if he's a best friend and you just learn his language and you begin to, to walk with him, which I mean is keeping step with him. So the Bible came to life. So three minutes over. Thank you for uh, not losing your mind at the appointed minute. But I would like to open it with Doug's. Well, Doug, I'm going to throw it back to you. We can do whatever you want to do with the rest of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'll go back to, I'll have to go back to gallery view here. Hold on a second. So, um, you know, we can't take too long here because we're going to break up into our groups, but I would like to take a few minutes. And um, uh, so everyone, anyone that wants to, to ask a question or something, you need to be very succinct, um, I mean, brief. Um, and uh, we could, we could take a few. So um, obviously you can, you can raise a hand. And um, you can raise the, um, okay, Graham, I see your, whatever that, what, what emoji hand, that's what it is, right? Is that the technical term? I believe I'm just so. like one of you young guys, I got it down. Okay. Well yeah, Graham. So set the pace, Graham, for being brief. I will. Thank, hey, thanks so much, kid. I'm super inspired. Question I wanted to ask was, as you're talking about the least of these, um, you know, you and I come from different backgrounds. Where would you start just in getting involved and what's the approach you would take? Um, Great question. Maybe somebody who comes from a little bit more of a vanilla okay. background. Yeah, and understand, I didn't always, you know, look like that. This is my tribute, by the way. Uh, that whole story is on my arm. You know, all those brothers, those prisons, those schools, those neighborhoods, that all the, they're all on this story. And so that I can't ever get away from them. When I was afraid to come back into the, the ministry in 2008, Ben Barnett, who now is the evangelist for hope, and I owe him everything. He, uh, I got a lot of them like that, but he was my Barnabas because nobody wanted to mess with me. And because I didn't, I wouldn't have either. I mean, and he said, no, nah, I don't think God's done with him. And he hired him and he even took some heat for that. And I said, what do you want me to do, bro? You know, do I, I'm not going to leave the marriage. So I think I might not, not, I should volunteer for that. And I'm probably past my prime there with the kids, young people. So, you know, I don't know exactly what you want me to do. And because they're going to pay me. And uh, he said, and I quote, bro, I want you to go out into the world and find out what God is up to and come back and tell us. <laughs> and I'm like, you're going to pay me for that? <laughs> and so that sent me on a journey. I went to the Atlanta Union Mission, which is the homeless shelter. And, uh, you know, I had to warm my way in. They said no a whole bunch of times, but I just wore them down. And finally said, just give me any time. Said Tuesday at four o'clock, but ain't nobody in there. They're sleeping. And, and so three brothers, Kenny and Tim and, and uh, another brother named Ed, and I preached like it was 3,000. And those brothers told a few friends, told a few friends, told a few friends. They closed that one down and went all the way down to Atlanta. 
And fast forward a few months, and on Wednesday nights, I was like, Brother Ben, is it okay if I miss midweek? Because, man, this thing here, God's doing something. We had 100 brothers, homeless brothers, in the chapel at night. <laughs> and they, we rocked. And God was, was allowing me to continue to preach to the least of these. And I wasn't just preaching in the church to the converted like I had for so long. And it, I'm so glad you asked this question, Graham. It, everything came alive because I saw them and they, they made me. And so, you know, we put them in a limo and took them to Ben's church where I, I guess maybe I was on staff then. And we put 12 brothers in a limo who were our homeless choir. And we, <laughs> they come up in a limo and they got out like they were rock stars, man. They were walking, they had sunglasses on, man. These weren't homeless brothers anymore. And I'm sure one of them was an angel, had to be. And so we get them up on stage and we sing, and it was horrible. I mean, it was just this horror, but it was the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And the church stood and they, and they made them do an encore. <laughs> and they got done and it's not like they hung around fellowship. No, they walked out like they came in and they got in their limo and we were out. It was beautiful. Graham, I have no idea why I told that story. But my point is, sometimes I have one, <laughs> is go serve somewhere, anywhere. Go find a bridge. You know what I'm saying? Underneath it, you'll find a friend. And the fact that you come from a little more vanilla, oh, bro, that, that'll impress them. You know, have some situational awareness, though. <laughs> They're crafty. They're crafty. All right. Yeah. Okay, so um, Colleen or Kyle? I don't know which one has her hand up, but yeah, I just had a quick question. Uh, Kit, you started um, sharing about your prayer for the uh, the reform czar. I just wanted to hear what what your prayer is. Uh, you started bringing out your book, and I saw all the notes in there that got me excited. Thank you. Preach to President Carter. It's his church. I want to go to his Sunday school class, which is everybody wants to go there. He's he's a legend. And I want to hear him preach, and I want to preach in his church, and that would be a huge thing. While I'm at it, Doug, if you don't mind, I review these steps every day, and I created them. And the dots are to remind me, okay, I'm to get on my knees first thing every morning. That's not a suggestion. I do it. I mean, but now I don't have to do it anymore because my brain does it. It's a habit. But I still make sure that, you know, we're going to talk about Uncle G next time. That's what I call the brain. Impossible prayers. Man, I checked that off. It's like, yeah, just stretch yourself, write down things. And all these seven steps. Man, I read the St. Francis prayer every single day. Why? Because I reboot myself around my purpose and remind me, today I'm a servant. You read that thing. You read that 40 times in a row, 40 days in a row. That's my impossible prayer list right now. And so see all the ones that are circled? That means that God showed up. And when you get to circle one, oh my gosh, so many of these are connected. But here's the crazy thing I added this time is I added 25, now there's probably about 30 of people that hold the keys to the doors that I wanna get through if God wants to open them. And so I just go through and I, and I review this list. I mean, DA the governor, commissioner of corrections, police chief, sheriffs, the ones that are running stuff all the way up. On a, I sit on a um, state of uh, House of Representatives in my state on a youth gang uh, prevention bill we're trying to get passed. And you better believe the governor's on there. And so I review it every day. See that circle? That's the pastor, Pastor Tony Loudon. And so I was praying for him before any of this happened. And it was stupid how it showed up. I go and volunteer at a poultry company here in town because they're helping some inmates. They're trying to give inmates jobs. And I'm like, they, they invite me to come start working with some of the guys. And so that connects me to Nevada where it's a hope for prisoners thing. And then he's connected to Pastor Loudon. And then, but I'm still can't get to him. So I show up and do a podcast with a producer. We get to be friends. He knows Pastor Loudon, sends me, sends him one of my books, not the new one, but another one. The prison czar had already read my book and I didn't even know it. He was on my list. And so it was meant to be. 
So do you see how God had it set up? So who was, what if I was sitting around going, how come you never answered my prayers? And he's like, go to the chicken plant and then just follow directions. Go to the place they pluck chickens. I don't want to go to chicken plant, man. It's gross. It's like, go. You'll, you'll figure it out. And then all of a sudden, doom, 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 doom. And I'm on a call with the prison czar. You want to be on my board? <laughs> uh, I'll consider it. <laughs> I was like, yeah. And so this is very real. And so the circling is really fun. And then I leave a lot of space. This is where you journal. This is God's fingerprints. And so you start off reviewing your day the day before. And these little bullet points, I don't know what happened on this day, but it's like, uh, oh, man, my boy read a book. The graduation went great. KSU called me back. Tip top poultry contract. Uh, PPP. I got the PPP loan. That was that day. And so you see what I'm saying? It's a real prayer journal. I want you to tear this thing up. There should, it should be bloody, man. This thing's, I got stacks of them. Anyway, I'm sorry you didn't get around to many more questions if we need to cut it, but yeah. I felt like I needed to tell you the process. So, because we, we're not going to see each other for three, four weeks. And so, I'm going to ask you those steps are crucial. You got to step out of your comfort zone, Doug. Or, yeah, no, or, thank you so much for that. Um, and yeah, it's just, um, you know, we've talked a bit, you know, offline here and, and, and now these two weeks. And, and uh, Kit's also shared with our staff and everything. And, and uh, you know, I just kept thinking throughout today, just, you know, thank God you repented, you know, <laughs> like, just, you know what I mean? Like, and, and just amazing how God reached out and at your lowest point and, and after you were at your highest point, you went to your lowest point and then, you know, God reached out to you and you didn't say no, you know, you said no for a while, but you finally didn't. And, and, you know, God's been able to do amazing things since then. And I think, you know, our, our church would collectively, you know, just thank you and, and uh, you know, can't wait for three more weeks when we get to spend some more time with you. And, but in the meantime, yeah, I appreciate, I think that's very important too. Um, you know, if there's any other quick tidbits that you need to give, you know, like that, and I've been, you know, in, in our little small group, we're always talking about, oh, I wrote that down. Oh, I wrote that down. You know, our God sightings. And I hope your other small groups are doing the same thing. But uh, um, I got a little tidbit that might be yeah. good for the, the discussion, right? Yeah. Um, I wrote down, like, I just, I do pointers to myself. So I just put imagine. So instead of just praying, wrote prayers, camp, camp on one and imagine. That's Bobby, what Talking about you... God. <laughs> I love Hold that. On. Debbie, can you mute everybody? That's awesome. Go ahead, kid. Um, imagine them. You know, if you're praying for something, go ahead and just imagination is more important than knowledge. Einstein said that. So it, it separates us from the creatures. I can, I can create something in my mind before it's even come to be. And God did that with his imagination. He created all things, but he spoke it into existence. But first it was in his mind heart, mind, language, we create. And so, man, your prayer time, in my opinion, should be a time of imagination. Guess what? It'll take away your anxiety and worry and dread and fear and panic. You can pick all that up later in the day if you want. But your imagination, you can't worry when you're imagining your dreams. Imagine your spouse the way that He's perfect, just the way you want him to be, just the way you want her to be. Imagine your son coming back in the embrace like you're the prodigal dad. And think about your neighbor. You, my father-in-law, a woman lost her husband. That's my, my father-in-law, my stepdad. I don't know why I had father-in-law, man. He cut this lady's grass for two years. And he still does to this day. She never asked him his, her husband died. And so my dad, one that God gave my mom after my dad passed, he cut that grass every, every other week for two years and still does. And she's never even come out and said, thank you one time. She's never acknowledged it. And he doesn't want thanks. Neighbors next door hit golf balls into his uh, pasture. They got property, you know, nine acres out there in beautiful Madison. And he goes out and he picks them up. He takes them inside. He washes all of them, puts them in a crown royal bag and leaves them on their step. And they've never said thank you, not one time. So what he did for Christmas is he bought a dozen golf balls. He had their name and um, whatever you do engraved on it. 
and he went and he, he gave him a Christmas present, put it on their step, never said thank you. And he doesn't care. He just keeps going. He's someone that some might say is not a Christian. Really? Hmm. Whoever, walk, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. So it's like that. So if you imagine things, it'll open up your eyes and you'll start seeing things you haven't seen. But I want to encourage you, if you need to start over again, start over. These are just quiet times. I want to call them power times, man. Let's, let's, let's do power times and let that be your charge like it was when we were young. And then all of a sudden things come alive. You don't have to be on, you can be on day whatever you want to be on. You know, it's up to you because it's not interfering with anything that preachers are doing. I always promised that, promised it to Doug when we started. I said, bro, this isn't going to replace or compete with anything you're doing. It's quiet times. That's it. You want your church on quiet times, man. So anyway. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, brother. We'll uh, uh, close out with prayer. And then if everybody could jump on your small groups and um, uh, at least, you know, give yourself 15, 20 minutes. I don't want to keep you too long there, but I think those discussions are important. And, and I think we're really able to encourage each other even in those times too. So uh, I'll pray here and then we can pop off, but yeah, everyone, you know, obviously just be praying. Um, Misha just reminded me, you know, uh, we seem to be praying for those families um, in, in, in Georgia, the, you know, the killings that took place yesterday in Atlanta. Um, and um, you know, it's, it's so much sad news, but uh, that kind of was a major headline. So uh, there's obviously a lot of families really, really hurting right now. So uh, let's remember that. But uh, let's pray here and get, thank you so much. I know you and I'll be in touch, but but yeah, we can't wait to see you uh, soon. And, uh, you know, I can always give the church any tidbits you send me too. So uh, yeah, and it was great to meet Roots again and uh, look forward to seeing uh, Roots in, per in, 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 in person. So amen. I'll put my email, in the, put my email down there if, um, if anyone needs it. There it is. Yeah. So, okay, let's have a word of prayer and then let's jump on our small groups, please. Thanks everyone for being here. Father, we uh, want to come to you right now and thank you for just another tremendous time of, of being with you and, and uh, just basking in the glow of your Holy Spirit and, and uh, being able to uh, uh, yeah, just be inspired, God. And no matter how old we are in the Lord, it's just always so encouraging to learn and to uh, uh, see new things and new ways of looking at things and to, to see you uh, in a different kaleidoscope, God, in all the, the myriad of ways that you, that you move and work that, that we might not imagine if we're just thinking about it on our own. And so we're so grateful for that. I pray it causes us all to, to love you more deeply. Uh, yes, I you know, pray we can encourage Kid absolutely, but I know, uh, you know from the bottom of his heart, he wants us just to love you more and give you all the glory, God. And so um, I'm just grateful that uh, he's allowing himself to be used in this way. And, and uh, yeah, I, I pray that you, you'll, th this will just be the genesis of so many uh, new things that we can do here to love people in greater and, and more meaningful and deeper ways, God. And certainly want to help become uh, people become Christians, God, and be saved. Uh, but we definitely just want to love people, God. We want to feed people and, and uh, just help people to see your light and your glory. And yeah, I just pray for all those families that uh, uh, must be so heartbroken, you know, right now and just the, the carnage there. And, and God, just, just pray because we know that's that's just one of probably many things that have gone on around the world that we that we don't even hear about and i know it breaks your heart god and i know um that in many ways though you don't get desperate in in, in your love it's a desperation for us to be a light to that broken world and and so i pray you'll allow us to be that god and you'll use us in tremendous ways and we'll be able to see those things happening and be able to write down and circle our prayers and our god sightings as well uh, as we watch you move uh, in powerful, powerful ways. We love you. We're humbled uh, more than anything else just by our salvation, God. The fact that you forgave and continue to forgive it just uh, continually changes us and cleanses us and makes us new. And we're grateful for that. We love you and thank you so much for the Houston Church and for kids' time with us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Love you, Kit. Thank you.